inclusion grantee program. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us today. Because we're having our grantees, two of them speak on their projects, we'll be recording the call for at least that portion of the call today. But when we shift into the usual training director consultation, we'll stop recording so that people can be free to consult uh, and not be concerned about uh, their questions for consultation being recorded. Um, but let me just go over a few things about our call today. Um, so first of all, the call will be facilitated by myself, Allison Osfed. I'm currently serving in the past chair role for the APIC Board of Directors and Dr. Jeff Baker, our executive director. So Jeff saying hi, uh, and we're delighted to facilitate today. Dr. Shona Voss is unable to join us. So it's just the two of us and we'll do our best uh, to provide support and structure to the call. Um, and then a reminder, I think we're all used to Zoom etiquette at this point, but if you can, we invite you to keep your cameras on, especially for the consultation component, but also for the presentations. I'm sure everybody at this point has had the experience of sharing information with uh, a, a Zoom room full of um, black boxes with no cameras on and it just really helps when you know your audience is with you and engaged so if you could leave your cameras on we know sometimes tech issues prevent this but if you could please leave them on so that we can see you and you know you're here we know you're here in the room with us and we can engage in the shared experience together and as usual we ask that you mute your mic unless you have questions uh, we recommend using the speaker view instead of the gallery view so you can focus on the person who's speaking, particularly today when we have guest presenters speaking about their projects, which we think you'll be excited about. Um, please do feel free to use the chat box at any time. Dr. Baker and myself will be doing our best to monitor the chat box and we can answer some questions ourselves or direct them to the speaker when the time is right to do so. So please feel free to put questions in the chat as they arise. Um, and again, uh, when we get to the discussion point and the Q&A point of today's community call, we ask that you keep your comments and questions brief so that others have a chance to chime in too as best as possible. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we are recording a portion of this call because we have our grantees giving presentations for all of us to benefit from. And we know not everybody can be on every community call, but when we shift into the consultation portion of the call, we will stop recording. And Jeff and I will do our best to remind each other of that. And someone from the audience can feel free to remind us if we forget to. Okay, um, so as usual, we have that open format in our structure for today, and that will be the second portion of the call. Uh, but in the first portion, we're deviating from our standard community call structure so that we can have formal presentations and hopefully some discussion as well from our grantees. And to start us off, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Barbara Garcia Lavin and her colleague who will be talking about one of the Tele Supervision and Education funded grants. And we're really excited to hear about the project. She'll tell us a little bit about it and they'll tell us where we can find the resources and we'll be able to ask questions. And after that, we'll hear from Dr. Lynette Bicos who is funded by our DEI RFP. And she'll be talking about, um, I think some really exciting statistical tools and uh, again, where you can find those and how to utilize them in your own work. So we're so delighted to have uh, both projects represented from both RFPs today. And to begin this conversation, this will be an ongoing effort on behalf of APIC to spotlight a number of grantees. So this is our first opportunity to do so, but in the coming calls, we'll continue to do this. So folks can hear more about um, the wonderful tools that our colleagues have developed that will help all of us in our training work that we do. And for today, I just wanted to note that what, we're, what we've asked our presenters to prepare to do is to each share about 10 minutes or so about their projects, how to utilize them, the tools that they developed, where to find them, and so on. And we've asked them to do that back to back, and then we will open up for Q&A and discussion about the projects with the PIs after both presentations have been completed. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat and Jeff and I will do our best to track it and circle back to the PI when it's time for Q&A. And then, as I mentioned, after we exhaust the discussion about the grants, uh, the grants and the tools, then we'll shift into our usual consultation topic. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing my screen and invite our first presenter. Thank you, Allison. Can everyone hear me? 
Oops, I've just opened the wrong file. I apologize for that. Give me one second. Oh my goodness, I apologize. I My mouse is not responding right. I'm not sure what's going on. Give me one second, please. I apologize. No worries. <laughs> I, I call it virtual hide and seek <laughs> when I'm trying to find my way. My goodness. There it is. There it is. Okay, so I am Barbara Garcia Lavin. I'm um, an associate professor and currently the DCT at um, Nova Southeastern University. For I'm the DCT for both the PhD and PsyD programs. Um, but before that, I was a an internship training director for seven years. So APIC has always been my home, and I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm presenting today along with my good colleague, uh, Dr. Anna Fins, who's a full professor here at the college, and um, we worked on this project together, and we're, we've been teaching the supervision and consultation course for our doctoral students here for about four years now, so we are extremely excited that that this project has happened and that we're going to hopefully be able to continue working on, on this important work going forward. Before I continue, I just want to make sure everyone can still hear me because all of a sudden I, I've lost my gallery view, so I can't see anyone. Can you all still hear me and see me? We can hear and see you. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is a very uh, text dense slide. I'm just going to summarize um, what we did with our with our very generous funds um, for you, so you have an idea what we did. Um, we really wanted to get an idea about how our supervisors in training. So these are fourth year doctoral students um, in their last year before they go off to internship. Usually, actually, their last semester before they go off on internship. Before they go to most of you who are internship uh, training directors, they take a class with us that is called supervision consultation. And in that class for the last three years, um, four years if you include this year, we have been providing them with supervision of supervision as part of the experience. So we, we went ahead and we surveyed them using a modified supervisor competency self-assessment tool that was developed by Fallender and her team. Um, and uh, what we wanted to get a sense was how they felt that um, they had developed supervisor competencies over the time that they provided supervision to first year doctoral students. Um, what we do in our classes is we team up fourth year advanced students as supervisors along with very first, you know, second semester first year students that are getting ready to go off to start practicum either over the summer or the following fall. And we have them work together um, to develop certain, certain competencies, competencies that'll uh, let us know if they're ready for practicum. So given the pandemic and everything that happened in the years between 2019 and 2021, we ended up having um, supervision that was delivered by these supervisors in training in three different formats. Uh, in 2019, they saw all of their students pretty much face to face. Uh, in 2020, they did a hybrid. We started the semester face to face and all of a sudden the pandemic happened and everybody had to switch to virtual. And then in 2021, um, I believe most of it, if not all of it, I think it was all of it was virtual. We were doing uh, synchronous video conferencing and or telephone calls or the students were doing that. So we, we thought, wow, how interesting we have this sort of um, three group situation here with face to face hybrid and virtual formats. And we were really curious to see if the format had any influence on the competencies or the self assessed competencies of the, the supervisors in training. So we went ahead and we surveyed them. We also surveyed the first year uh, students that that were their supervisees, we ended up with about 75 supervisors in training and 110 supervisees that completed the surveys uh, entirely. And our findings were very interesting. These supervisors in training perceived themselves to experience greater competency developing supervision in a hybrid or fully virtual format relative to providing supervision in, in person. And we thought that was really interesting. And actually the students that received supervision from them also reported the most satisfaction with their supervision when it was delivered in a hybrid format. Um, that was significantly greater supervision uh, or satisfaction uh, relative to supervision that was delivered either in a 
hybrid format or via telesupervision was, was preferred to in-person supervision. So we also thought that was interesting. And it extends some existing findings that are out there that show that really there's no difference in satisfaction um, depending on, on the uh, formats of supervision. But more recently, there have been some findings that there might be some advantages to telesupervision uh, over in-person supervision, which is kind of leading us to to want to go further and, and see what might be behind this phenomenon um, with some of our uh, future studies. The other part of the project that we did was we developed a supervision instructional guide. Um, it's really a tool that we thought would be helpful. It's based on what we've done in our courses over the years and what we did with these um, supervisors and supervisees and training. Um, we thought it would be really helpful to develop a guide that could help um, not just other doctoral program courses, but also internships and postdoc programs. Um, it's really, it was informed from all of our years of teaching and providing supervision of supervision to our fourth year students. Um, it, it's a tool for teaching supervision. Um, and like we said, it can be used with, uh, within a doctoral course, but it can also be used as part of seminars um, with interns or with postdoc trainees. It provides um, a 12 week program. Uh, the first about six weeks or so are didactic and the second six weeks are a guide for providing different topics and supervision of supervision. And we always in our class in our classes, we try to have the supervisors meet with their supervisees at least six times during the 12 week period, um, during which we're, we're constantly providing them with supervision of supervision and kind of guiding them through the process. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Finns, Anna Finns, who's gonna talk a little bit about the the, um, the actual modules for each of the, the, either the didactic or the supervision of supervision. Thank you, Dr. Garcia Lavin. Um, so I'm going to very briefly talk about first the didactic topics. So as Dr. GL mentioned, um, the, our course is split so that the first um, six to seven weeks are didactic around supervision. Um, and then the second half of the semester, we focus on the supervision of supervision and the actual activities where the supervisors in training are meeting with the supervisees, the first year students. So our didactic, and, and by the way, in the, um, the instructional guide that you're gonna get access to, you will see that we have our syllabus. So you can kind of take a look at um, how we have structured the actual course. Um, that that's embedded in in the guide. So the first again, the first half of the semester is really focusing on um, giving the, the the fourth year students just some foundation for what supervision is. And and we we primarily use the competency based supervision framework that Ballinger and Shafransky um, have developed. Um, that you know, kind of uses a very systematic and comprehensive approach to um, teaching and, and then getting the supervisors to um, utilize knowledge, skills, um, and attitudes uh, across a variety of, of different competencies related to supervision. So that's really the goal of the didactic um, topics. And, and we kind of go through just a very um, sort of throw introduction to supervision. We move from there to discuss models and formats that can be utilized um, within supervision. We also focus on addressing personal issues, ethics, and, and some of the legal issues that can come up and, and, and kind of wrap up that first half by um, spending some time talking about the importance of culturally competent supervision. Um, all of this also, you know, kind of embedded in here is also kind of getting them to the, the supervisors and training to understand that in addition to these competencies, there are additional roles of the supervisor. So, you know, that role of evaluation, of providing feedback and, and really important gatekeeping. Um, and so um, once we get through this first half and we move into the supervision of supervision uh, modules, um, and so, um, you know, SOS help, but um, SOS has been, uh, you know, let, let's focus on what you're going to be doing with these supervisees that you're going to be meeting with. And let's, and so every week, we kind of address a different topic. And some of this is building on um, what was done as part of their um, 
of their didactic training. So the, the first module that we cover is, is managing the supervisory relationship. You know, and again, it's a lot of addressing the characteristics um, of an effective supervisor of a competent supervisory process. Um, and um, the way that the guide, again, once you get to, to see the guide, these modules have um, two kind of processes. One is the things that are gonna be covered in the supervision of supervision. So the supervisor working with the supervisors in training, but then there's also an additional piece, which is for the supervisors in training themselves, things that they can use with their supervisees. So they kind of parallel each other in, in some ways. So this first, um, this first module really is, you know, kind of laying the groundwork for what the expectations for um, Soup of Soup is, you know, discussing telesupervision versus face-to-face -face supervision um, that, that will be done. And, and this year, we're actually allowing them to choose which type of supervision they want to do. So again, I think um, we're going to try to continue um, to collect data on this to, to see if those initial findings sort of, um, um, you know, are, are replicated or, or continue to be um, to, to be the way they are. Um, the second module is on self-awareness and self-reflection, um, sort of, you know, recognizing and understanding um, their developmental stage, that of the supervisors in training, but also of the supervisees. So, you know, kind of helping them understand and bring clarity to um, the, the focus that their supervisory experience should, should take and, and kind of developing some goals around um, training. Um, the third module is one uh, risk assessment. You know, when, whenever a supervisor is working with a, a, a new supervisee, I know that there's always a lot of, of you know, um, angst and anxiety from the supervisee about uh, recognizing um, risk and being able to assess risk. And for new supervisors, that also can be very stressful. And, and, and so uh, we do have a module dedicated to, to you know, recognizing, um, you know, the, that kind of anxiety that comes for beginning clinicians and for beginning supervisors. And we provide them with uh, you know, different resources. And, and these are resources that we hope to continue to build on to help them and to help the, the support and support the training of the supervisors um, in, in the work that they'll be doing. Um, we also cover diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of this module, um, you know, providing them a, a bit of an outline to guide uh, responsive as well as competent multicultural supervision um, to facilitate the development of the supervisees in terms of their multicultural competency via a variety of different resources that we provide in the uh, in the guide. Um, the uh, next module is the self-disclosure module. Um, and again, similar to the risk assessment, I think to some degree we kind of all struggle with um, self-disclosure. And so the model sort of focuses, I mean, the module sort of focuses on preparing the supervisors in training for addressing appropriate self-disclosures with the supervisees. Um, lastly, we've got the future planning, self-care and preventing burnout. Um, as the last module, we wanted to make sure that we, um, you know, addressed uh, and promoted some self-awareness and self-reflection around further growth in the, in the context of their work as supervisors for the supervisors in training, and, and also for them to be able to foster that you know, parallel process as well for the supervisees um, in, in their own uh, growth and development. Um, and, and, and also you know, paying attention to self-care and, re and recognizing the need uh, for self-care plans. Um, so overall, I think the, the goal of our guide has been to help us identify some basic and critical areas of training for new supervisors. Um, and um, we recognize that you know, the, these modules are certainly not exhaustive, um, but again, it opens the door to highlighting some of the concepts that we think will be helpful in a supervision of supervision context and with the idea that we will kind of build from here and expand um, these modules.
Dr. Giel, are you gonna? I'm trying, it wasn't responding. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there go. I'm sorry. So do you wanna talk about this one? So here is a QR code. Um, you can take your phones and take a photo of this, and this should bring you to the instructional guide. Please let me know if you have any difficulty scanning this or opening it. If you do, I will provide a link uh, to the instructional guide, and you can get to it a different way. But this is our QR code that hopefully will work for everyone. Please let me know. It looks like they're getting it, so that's good. Great. It works great. Okay, so that's all we have. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think this is um, so exciting and interesting to hear about the satisfaction as well as the uh, self-assessment of competency acquisition and the sort of similarities, but also differences. Um, and um, we are just so grateful for the guide. Uh, I think this is something that could be used at all levels of training. And um, this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, we were hoping would come out of the RFPs. And I just wanna thank you for responding to the call to action and then sharing your time with us today to tell us about it and, um, and your willingness to stay on the call. Just as a reminder for folks who've joined at different times of the call, we're hearing from two grantees today. And the first was from our telehealth and, or excuse me, teleeducation supervision and training RFP. And the second will be from our uh, diversity equity uh, and uh, social justice RFP. And so we'll hear from our second uh, grantee PI, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, about either project from the audience. So thank you all for being here. And just wanna welcome now uh, Dr. Lynette Bicos to share about really exciting exciting tool, which I, I, I can't introduce properly, but your enthusiasm for the idea of recentering statistics in a way that's not, um, you know, white and heteronormative and all of those things is so exciting. Um, so I want to turn it over to you to, to tell us about it and where to utilize the tools that you've developed and are continuing to develop. Thank you. Um, Allison, I can see you. Can you hear me and see the screen properly? Yes, to both. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this is so exciting and I'm just so grateful for the grant. Um, my name is Lynette Bikus and I'm uh, at Seattle. My, my pronouns are she, her and hers. Uh, my university is Seattle Pacific University and we're on the ancestral lands of the um, Duwamish. And the project to grant the grant title that was funded was Psych Stats in R, Open, Accessible, and Recentered. And I'm um, just really excited to tell you about it today, like the previous presenters. And oh, by the way, I'm so distracted by the amazing information you guys presented. Um, it solves about three problems we're having in our clinical psychology program. And so before the end of the day, I will be forwarding it to our director of training. So thank you. Um, just super exciting for so many reasons. Um, so um, the sort of the story is that about four years ago, um, the university was uh, our, we are a private small um, liberal arts university mostly. And so our API accredited clinical psychology program is a bit of an anomaly. We were heavy SPS users. And for several years, we had been getting pressure like, can you please quit buying so many SPSS licenses? Do you really need the super spendy ones that have multiple imputation? Um, you got to help us reduce our computing costs. And I, well, I'm a regular at WPA, and I had noticed um, that over you know, like about five years, all of the stats camp presentations that they have a two hour stats workshop every day at WPA, it's completely awesome if you haven't gone or been there. Uh, we're transitioning from SPSS to R. And we realized that many of the graduates we train are trained in pretty high-end statistics, you know, hierarchical linear modeling, SEM, and they get out and the places they work may not have the fee-for-service programs like SPSS or M+. So we, with, together with our IO program, which is also a PhD program, made the commitment to transition from uh, SPSS to R. And um, oh my gosh, uh, at that stage in my life, after having taught and learned SPSS for 25 years, it has been quite the rugged transition, um, but it has been completely worthwhile. And now we're starting to see our students have some of that same joy. Some of our students have some of that 
same joy. Uh, anyway, uh, so that was one of the motivations behind this. Um, the other motivation was my attendance uh, at Academics for Black Lives in 2020, both the, both times they ran the entire curriculum and then again in 2024 or 2020 last year. I can't, I don't know my years, wherever we are, two years in a row. Um, and so in that, um, in Academics for Black Lives, we were challenged to think about uh, decentering whiteness and centering other voices. And as I, that word centering just kept going around and around in my head because in my context, it's about centering variables in a regression equation. And so um, I started to think about when, when we came back that fall 2020 and we were talking about decolonizing our curriculum and having an increasingly socially and culturally responsive pedagogy, how are we going to do it? One, one of my faculty actually said, well, you don't have to, Lynette, because you teach stats and there's kind of no way to do that. And I said, game on. Um, and so this is my response. And then APEC, you, the grant, the RFP was the perfect and perfectly timed motivation I needed to really uh, push this. So I just want to show you uh, what we've done. Um, the highlight, the highlight first R makes um, teaching it um, more accessible and our graduates then can use R in their graduate. But then the center of this is really about the research vignettes. For every statistic that I teach, I go find an article that has centered a social justice theme as the content and the authors are um, the first author identity. I try to find as much as I can uh, from a group where a scholarship has been historically marginalized and um, where the statistic that is the, the, folk, the primary statistic in the article is the one I'm teaching. So every article that's picked has to be uh, from that. So I want to show, um, oh, I forgot that I was going to switch. Uh, I want to show, and I can't quite see my, sorry about this. Uh, let's see here. I sort of forgot this part of the problem. I want to show um, the QR code would take you here uh, this is the first volume that's ready and it's being peer reviewed now it's available to anybody who wants it but it's pre peer reviewed. And so, for example, this is the ANOVA, um, the, and volume is really too big of a word, but the technical and the technology behind it is that I write the entire lecture in R, not just the stats, but the entire chapter is written in R and rendered through our markdown and book down and through the GitHub. It is freely available through the GitHub pages. So there's a lot of pages to it. Um, so there's kind of volumes. This one is on One Way Inova. I have one that's ready to go almost on psychometrics. We'll have one on um, hierarchical linear modeling. And so there's, they're kind of introduced in separate volumes only because it takes so much computer power to remake the book with all the statistics going on underneath. So if we look at the basic chapter on uh, One Way ANOVA, um, it's really directed toward the science advocate practitioner. If you're a quantitative psychologist, you're probably not gonna be terribly interested in this book because this is really on the mechanics of how to uh, get it done with the goal being an APA style results section that would go in an, in an article. So every single um, chapter has measurable and observable learning objectives written in APA style. Um, there's also a heads up, like here's what I think you should do for homework, only I call it planning for practice because that sounds better. Um, these are, most of these I would require in my own classes, but I always list the resources that I've used in preparing the lecture. Um, and for example, Navarro's text is another amazing, amazing open education uh, research resource and then the research vignette. Um, there's always a workflow. Uh, students crave like decision trees for how you work through what the assumptions, how do you test them, what happens if they're violated. Um, and then I highlight um, the research vignette that's being used. Then although students aren't expected to do this, this is the simulation. Um, one of the things about R is that kind of connecting your data set into R gets a little tricky. So if, you hang, if you're hanging out on R blogs for learning how to do things, uh, a lot of it is used from simulated data. So that works great um, for, the, um, for the chapters. And then we just work through the problem. Now for this one way ANOVA, I also need to teach kind of the, that sort of uh, 
conceptual stuff that goes behind it. So first we do it all by hand and then only doing it in R. And then second, we work through it again um, with our, our, our code. So in the NOVA chapters, most of them are worked twice to teach the concepts behind one way ANOVA and then how to do it in R. Then I wanna get to close to the end. There's a lot here. As you get close to the end, I always, um, I always um, show how to write it up in an APA style results section, what the writing should be, what the table should look like, what figures should accompany it. And these are intended as recipes. So students can just sort of pull it and put in their own, uh, put in their own results and modify it accordingly. And then the other piece that I believe is recentered is the practice problems. So when I teach stats, I teach it from the notion of like, I want you to stretch yourself with a, with a goal. And if ANOVA is new to you, uh, maybe you just go back up to the original simulation that I provided and change the random seed. And if you simply change that one number and re-simulate the data, you should be able to work the problem in a way that's very parallel to what I did and feel a little bit confident about what one way ANOVA is. Almost every um, article that we find has either multiple DVs or multiple IVs that aren't used. And so I provide, I make that data available. And so maybe you just swap out uh, an independent variable, a predictor or an outcome and rework the problem that way. Or maybe if you are like ready to go, you've got data you have access to, or you simulate a different set of data and you can work the problem that way. So that's the, um, that's the resource. While I'm here, so I'm not switching back and forth between um, between the PowerPoint and the um, the web, um, I have a, a research team website, and so it lists the links to all the um, the volumes that are in progress um, and that are available available. Uh, freely. So right now we have an ANOVA, a multivariate modeling. This one is kind of poorly named. I'm most proud of the first uh, four chapters about cleaning and formatting data, scrubbing and scoring data diagnostics and multiple imputation. And then it has some Hayes style mediated mediation, moderation, moderated mediation. There's a few chapters on multi-level modeling. Um, Psychometrics is ready to go. We're just copy editing it now. And then extras is just all that mechanical fun stuff that I like to do uh, that have questions about R. So if we head back to the PowerPoint, um, where did I leave off? The process right now is that before just the, my librarians at SP are amazing and they're helping me getting it to an open education referatory so that it's officially available as an open education resource. But before we do that, I'd really like to have it reviewed. So I'm looking for three kinds of people with three kinds of expertise. One, stats savvy people. Two, people who are, um, who are wise about what it takes to have a, a, a textbook that's socially and culturally responsive, and third, people who are familiar with open education resources. And um, so if you are game to look at a chapter or two and then provide feedback, um, there's uh, links to both that page that the ANOVA volume and then links to the peer review survey. And if you get to any one of those resources, you'll have links to the others. So that's kind of where I am in the process. And then this grant also kind of started a fire in Division 17, the Society of Counseling Psychology. Um, Amy Reynolds is the president and she has a curriculum and praxis presidential initiative and she's identified a gazillion work groups to um, create a socially and culturally responsive pedagogy across the counseling psychology curriculum. Um, and so she asked me to lead the research working group. And so, because this is what I know how to do, I guess, uh, we're going to co-author an open education resource that we've tentatively titled Transforming Research Methods and Health Services Psychology Applications for the Advocate Practitioner Scientist. Our goal is to have six draft chapters ready by APA, but, we're, but the, the nature of open education is that it's perpetually in progress. So you can always fix your copy editing editors and you can always add or replace brand new chapters. So if you are interested in any of that, I would just welcome to, I would just love to hear from you and get you involved. We still need um, a ton of authors. And I think that's, that's it. Thanks for wow. that.
Thanks for mentioning that, Dr. Vikos, about uh, Dr. Reynolds. She is the keynote speaker for the APIC Membership Conference in May, so I hope to see many of you there. Excellent choice, and I will put those links in the chat since they were kind of fast. Thank you so much. Um, wow, I, I mean, I am just in awe with the projects that are, and these are just the first two we're spotlighting, so I hope everybody else is as excited as I am to hear about um, the other projects as well. So I just can't thank um, both PIs and your teams enough uh, for the work that you're doing on behalf of all of us um, to, to do better and learn and grow in these realms. And I really wanna open it up to the audience for uh, questions or feedback uh, around these two projects that we've heard about today to start. Um, so folks, feel free to unmute and speak up and ask direct your question to the PI or PIs of either project. Maybe if you're thinking about implementation, you want some guidance about how to pick up these projects and use them or lessons learned. Uh, this is Ty from the University of Washington uh, and the School of Medicine. Uh, thank you both. These are amazing presentations. This always exceeds my, I'm excited when I get on these calls. One of the questions I guess I had was more about the supervision. So one of the things that we deal with on internship is that given the level of where our trainees are, there isn't really access to practicum students in all of their rotations. And so it is really hard to figure out ways in which to give more supervision or to somehow practice supervision skills with people who are currently on their internship year. I'm curious of what other people thought or if the, the people who are doing the presentations have thoughts about ways that during the internship year, we might be able to hone or work on competencies around supervision given the limited ability of having other students to utilize as, as kind of proxies. Well, our guide does have the didactic component that could be a start or a starting point. Um, the other idea that comes to mind is um, maybe partnering with a university where they might um, be interested in having either their advanced students or maybe even their first year students work with the interns to develop their own competencies and readiness for practicum or even as they start to apply for internship, you know, maybe some developing some kind of a partnership with a local doctoral program. Um, might be an idea that could, even if there's not a practicum student place at the site, maybe the interns could participate in a class like a supervision consultation class as, as take on the role of a supervisor uh, in partnership with a doctoral program. That's an idea that I have. I mean, it's not what we do, but it could, could be something, <laughs> maybe. I think that's a great idea. I wonder if, um, since this is our community call and we have a community of training directors from internship and other levels of training, I'm curious if other folks have um, thoughts or examples of what maybe they've done um, to share with the community and to answer Ty's question specifically. Anyone, anyone not have PRAC students in their internship and find a way to do this? And if so, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, this is Karen Wolf from Washburn Center for Children in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so we have a large community mental health agency that has interns in other disciplines. So we have LMFT students and social work students and uh, professional counselor students that are supervised by clinicians in the agency. So we've partnered our interns up um, across the discipline to supervise some other uh, clinicians that are in learning. And so far, uh, the few years that we've been doing it, uh, we've had a lot of uh, positive pairings and people learning uh, both ways from different disciplines as well as our interns getting that experience with supervising. That's a great example. So interprofessional supervision rather than within discipline as a solution to not having psychology practicum students for your interns to supervise. How about others? Any other examples of how you've addressed this? important components in the, it's in the SOA, so it's important right, for our accreditation. Hi, I'm, I'm Jessica Marshall from the Chicago Area Christian Training Consortium, um, and that's an issue where we found some, un, some variability across different sites within the consortium about availability of practicum students for supervision. Um, one thing that we've found to be helpful is we've started 
um, paying a, a somebody who has some expertise in supervision to provide a consultation group for all of our students together uh, across the different sites. And that way the students that are directly providing supervision can present their cases in a de-identified way and get some consultation on that. And then the students who aren't able to do that are able to learn through that process and through the observation of what's happening there. Uh, so I don't know if there are other levels of supervision happening within the agency that they might be able to, to be involved in the process of that. And, um, maybe watching even a you know, licensed person supervising at, at, at another level of training postdoc or something like that, but it might be a, an option for them that way. Thanks, Jessica. Any other creative solutions? I was thinking that um, one thing that might be useful is taking the guide that we heard about and having a seminar or a didactic series. But if you didn't have practicum students to use applied vignettes and role play, because it, I don't believe the SOA requires that they actually supervise another person, but rather that they attain the competencies. And so that might be another way to work on practicing the competencies, kind of going through all of those important steps um, that, that are addressed in, in the guide and then doing them in a vignette or a role play fashion, that might be another way to do it. And then with observations, we could observe and rate the competencies even um, if needed. Any other questions uh, around this project or other ideas or other questions for um, our, um, our other project too? We want to help people implement and use these tools. So whatever you feel you need to know to try to pick them up and run with them, this is a great opportunity to ask while the authors are here, the developers are with us. We will have a number of the uh, uh, authors also at the APIC conference uh, for poster sessions as well. Not everyone uh, is going to be able to make it, but a number of them will be. So this series between now and May, uh, we'll also have several folks at the uh, APIC conference where you can do some individual discussion with them about that as well. And I'm sure both of our speakers will um, be willing to take questions and uh, that you think of later on and, and email them for uh, additional information about their resources. Both wonderful presentations to be helpful to our membership and uh, very timely uh, as well. Couldn't agree more, Jeff. Okay. One more time, any any questions for our presenters? I, I'm thinking about in clinical settings, how we might be thinking about these statistical resources and how we might utilize those in a primarily clinical, you know, I love the idea of leading with advocacy. And so I was just thinking about that. And, you know, if anyone was thinking about what they're doing, maybe QI initiatives and how these tools might be helpful for that and how they might orient their faculty even, and then their trainees to utilizing them outside of a doctoral program setting. So that came to my mind as a question that I thought this audience might have, I'm not sure. Also, I know that internship training directors and postdoc training directors are very, very busy with their schedules and their time. And research doesn't get up to the top of this, writing manuscripts. TEP is a journal that was started by APIC and APA to put some of these manuscripts in there. Uh, we don't have as many training directors writing as I think that we should have. We want our colleagues and the other training councils to understand that we are science driven as well. And I think publication is one way to demonstrate that. And these topics are so important because there's not much data out there. And so many changes have been happening over the last couple of years. I am certainly hopeful that you all will consider publishing uh, the, these, both of these projects and any of you training directors out there that are interested in being part of it, I'm sure they would be willing to talk with you about that. Can I ask one more since no one else wants to? I, yes, I am please, fascinated by the supervisor. Okay, sorry, everyone. Um, uh, I am curious again about the supervision and the interest in the fact that there was um, greater satisfaction and competencies in telehealth than in person. Um, as we are moving towards 
going back into uh, learning that could be in person, we our, our rotation sites are spread out. And to be honest with you, we have now really liked Zoom and the ability it gives us to be much more flexible with people's schedules and a lot less um, uh, driving in the car. And so we are trying, we are struggling as an internship to figure out what is the right mix? We're gonna try a hybrid model first. Um, I will say there are parts of the university that really want us all of us to be back on campus so that we can all be in person. And yet um, for those of us who have been extremely productive by not coming into the office, there's, a, there's this tension about how much time, because if I'm serious, I spend a lot of time traveling between sites. And so Zoom and, and telehealth allow us a lot of flexibility and a lot of productivity that I'm worried is going to get hampered. And so I'm curious if you have ideas. I know I've looked at the literature as well that people seem satisfied and I use telehealth for all my clinical work right now. So my clients are getting better and feel fine. And so we've talked about this on the internship side, but curious about what other people are thinking about as we start to move back into this tension between do we have to be in person? And is there, as Mark was, as Jeff was saying, the evidence that supports that telehealth is actually quite viable and we don't need to do this. Like there's there's this tension between people feel like they want to and then there's this data that we could provide that says this is, that telesupervision is good enough or teletherapy is good enough and we may not need to be this in person. And I think that's where I'm struggling as my own world is trying to figure out what to do next <laughs> during a great pandemic. Barbara, do you want to share your um, your just in brief the findings again about the sort of a competency acquisition piece versus the satisfaction for supervisees piece? Because that would get at, at least a, a bit of empirical evidence um, to answer some of Ty's question. And then I think probably there are lots of folks on the call who might chime in as we're kind of all sorting this out similarly, I imagine. Yeah, Ty, I feel like you you summarized our lived experience here at NSU <laughs> um, and why we're driven to continue this work, I think, um, because of these preliminary, and they are very preliminary findings, I do want to say that. Um, but what we found, just to sort of repeat, is, is that um, the supervisors in training uh, really rated themselves um, as experiencing greater competency delivering supervision in a hybrid, so a mixed um, either you know face to face a combination of face to face and some sort of tele tele supervision or fully virtual, so fully um, you know tele tele supervision format. They they felt more competent, um, and we don't have any data to say why that is yet. We're going to look into that, but we speculate that that might be that these are um, newer learners probably digital natives, they feel like they have access to their resources right there on their computer when they're supervising, they might be able to pull up resources to share much more easily. And it doesn't have to come from years of experience or memory, they have access to the web to their own files. I mean, they just have it there at their fingertips. So I can imagine or we speculate that that's probably contributing to their sense of competency that's greater than if they're doing this in person. One of the things we've talked about is maybe surveying um, more seasoned supervisors, those have ha that have had many more years of experience, maybe even providing both telesupervision as well as face-to-face -face supervision and seeing what that looks like um, from that perspective. So that's a project we've been, we've been sort of thinking about. Um, and then with respect to satisfaction uh, from the folks, the first year trainees in this case that received the supervision, they reported the most satisfaction with supervision delivered in a hybrid format. Um, and significantly greater satisfaction from supervision delivered in either a hybrid format um, or via telesupervision relative to in-person supervision. So the in-person was the least satisfying for these um, supervisees as well. So that's just very interesting preliminary data that we're gonna keep looking into. <laughs> I guess it's kind of a follow-up question, which uh, probably is beyond the scope of your project, but maybe it's for a good next step is uh, faculty supervisors and if it's similar findings, because uh, these are these are trainees. And if we're thinking, uh, I, I know I'm an internship program, if we're wanting to implement more hybrid telesupervision into our program, um, it would be 
helpful to have some data about faculty supervisors around um, in-person versus hybrid versus telesupervision. I don't know if in your work you ran into anything that other folks have done or if you have some thoughts about that. That's actually one of our next studies that we're going to do is with some of our more seasoned supervisors. Yeah. Um. I love that the, it's just the beginning for both of the projects that we heard about today and how much of the work continues. Uh, it really does seem like a, a fire that's building in both projects in different ways. Um, I feel like I want to take Lynette's class so that I can utilize, like, I grew up in SPSS too, and so I was thinking, how do I do this? <laughs> but it just seems uh, that it would be so valuable to make a transition like this and have the open access, because we hear that too, even in the VA, I do hear that, like, why do you have to get this SPSS license, you know? Um, so it just is um, so timely, and um, yeah, I, I I'm so excited about both of the projects and how it's the beginning of really um, transformative work. Thank you. Can I just say, um, I, Ty, I'm just, I love your questions about virtual and the benefits of it. I, my classes, my stats classes are gonna stay online. Um, and I have, because I think we're both in Seattle, Ty. And so the A, a commute, uh, but then B, um, oh my gosh, I am so much more effective as a stats consult when I can just get like as close as I want to my laptop and we're screen shared and I can see and there's like Microsoft Teams and some others let you just take over if you need to. And so it's just so much more efficient. I'm not distracted by anything but the cat. Um, and so um, there's just, I, oh my gosh. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> Yes, I will just say, if you don't know, we have two of your students coming on internship this year, thanks to Match. So um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, it, we, are, we are mutually happy as well. So it, it is nice to meet a name with a face. This, again, the world, is, the world is grand and small at the same time, so. For sure. Um, and I see a comment in the chat. Well, first of all, I want to be sure that for our, our PIs, um, you're aware that there have been a number of positive comments comments in the chat. So folks in the community on the call today, thanking um, you know, each, each of you for the important resources and seeing the value and utilizing them in their internship and postdoctoral training. So I want to make sure that you hear that just in case you're, um, you don't have your eyes on the chat. Um, and then also there's a request for updates. So I think um, as the projects evolve, uh, if you want to share some of that with me, I can, or Jeff too, Jeff and I, um, we can pass it on to the listserv if you're not part of the APIC listservs, or if you want to post to our email groups uh, directly, of course, feel free to do that. Uh, but it sounds like there's a lot of enthusiasm for the next steps and where these projects are going. And, and this is exactly what we wanted in uh, funding these projects was to create uh, tools that could be shared, so disseminated and then implemented in other settings across the levels of training from doctoral all the way through to post doctoral. And, and so this is just a wonderful showcase of how that can happen. And, um, and I hope people feel free to reach out directly to our presenters as well, if you implement and then have questions along the way, because I bet they'd love to hear that. Um, that always makes my day when I can uh, create a resource that is helpful to someone else and they use it. And then we can talk about how it went and maybe um, troubleshoot anything. So and we do have just a few moments. So if there are any other questions or comments from the community, please feel free to speak up now. No other questions. Jeff, do you wanna share again briefly um, the dates of the conference? I know we've had a few people join us, um, so they may not have access to the chat, but if you enjoyed this kind of conversation, there will be more conversations like this at the APIC membership conference, which is uh, slated to happen in May. And Jeff, you wanna share some of those details? Sure, sure. We are very pleased that uh, we're having an in-person conference here, May 12th through the 14th. Uh, there will be a new training directors workshop on the afternoon of the the 12th, that Thursday, and then programming uh, throughout Friday and Saturday, the 13th and 14th in San Diego, California. 
We are so uh, pleased to get this back online. So we're hoping that many of you can get there. It's a low registration cost for APIC members at $150. And the rooms in San Diego Gas Lamps quarter there are, I think, 224 or 209. I can't quite remember, but I know it's pretty low for San Diego. So I'm hoping that people can join us there uh, for an exciting conference where you'll get a chance to interact with folks. And Jeff, we do, we are working with APA to have site visitor and self-study training. No, APA, APA has declined. They have declined, okay. So we will not have the site visitor workshops this year. Sorry, there was a question in the chat about that. And then do you wanna um, share about the first uh, 200 or 150 registrants? Uh, yes, I do, sort of. There okay. we are uh, for the first 250 people that show up at the conference uh, that have registered and paid the full price, they will get a $100 gift card to use at your convenience. We really want you there is what we're saying. Yes. And so we're hopeful that that would help reduce some of the financial burden for folks. Um, we will be doing a live stream for folks who um, don't feel that travel's right at this time or their institutions won't support them in traveling. So there will be that, but uh, I think it won't won't have the same feeling as the in-person. So we hope it will be it there. will be limited to the CE, most of the CE right. presentation. So uh, just encouraging you that there will be some available, though. Uh, we do hope that people can join us and we understand that those are it's iffy times for sure and hopefully your institution will support this. And then Jeff, do you remember offhand when the new training director workshop is there's a question in the chat on our agenda for the conference. It's Thursday, May 12th from I think it's 2:30 to 5 right now. I think it's the afternoon. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, again, we want to extend our uh, deep gratitude to our PIs for their work and taking the time to share it with our community today and uh, and to all of you for being here to have a community call discussion. I think in the interest of um, self care and having some time for transition, it makes sense to end the call with a few minutes before I'm sure the next zoom meeting that everybody has so <laughs> thanks again I put in the chat um, our time for next month and we hope others can um, join us and um, thank you all again we really appreciate each of you. Bye for now. <laughs>